last week's review, I think I pretty much had to do this. This is Darius Gaiden played through the Taito Legends 2 PS2 compilation, and it's a damn good game. In fact, I'd probably say this is, from what I played on this compilation, my second favorite game on here, next to the venerable Puchi Karat. The story is, wait, what? Yeah, they, they actually only show you about two seconds of story, and they give you about three paragraphs of dialogue. Um, they don't give you near enough time to actually read what the hell is going on with the plot, but as far as I was able to get from the few sentences I was able to read, humans are going back to colonize their planet, and these weird space fish monsters are attacking them, I think, maybe. And now you're the last starfighter, go stop them. Actually... I quite like this conceptually simply by virtue of the fact that pretty much all the enemy ships are designed after Deep Sea Life, and Deep Sea Life is both equal parts intriguing and terrifying. So it really does sort of hit home that these are completely alien creatures that are horrifying and out to destroy us. The fact that they're giant and, you know, laser equipped and missile equipped is just a bonus. Now the gameplay to Darius Gaiden is very, very simple. You move with the control stick. You hold down the square button to shoot. You press the X button to drop your screen clearing ultra black hole bomb of mega death. And uh, well, that, that's it in terms of controls, but there is a lot more in depth in terms of gameplay. First and foremost are your weapons. This game is actually very, very subdued in terms of weapons because while there are weapon upgrades, they follow an entirely linear path. Essentially, you just pick up weapon upgrades, and once you've collected enough, your weapon upgrades. Simple enough. However, unlike a lot of other games that have, like, crazy giant screen clearing lasers and, you know, tracking shots and all sorts of crazy stuff, really, you just get an additional bullet, or maybe your shots turn to lasers or something. It's kind of underwhelming after you've played a couple of bullet hell shmups that have just these crazy weapons, but at the same time, they're entirely functional. And the upgrade style I actually kind of like from a gameplay perspective. I'm personally not very good with it, but the fact is, in order to upgrade your weapons, you have to collect multiple weapon upgrade icons, and the color delineates what weapon I'll upgrade, whether it's your bomb or your laser. However, if you die, you lose progress towards your upgrade. So you really have to play cautiously, but at the same time, you have to play aggressively in order to shoot down the ships that carry the power-ups. And then you have to play really, really defensively to survive long enough to pick them up and try and figure out what you need to do from there. And it actually creates a really fun and interesting sort of ebb and flow to combat. It's genuinely intriguing to experience it, even though the weapons themselves are largely underwhelming. But I also think it's a good thing that the weapons aren't overly extravagant, simply by virtue of the fact that this is one of those games where your entire hitbox is your sprite. So if you're used to that bullet dodging nonsense, that ain't gonna fly here. And if you overly clutter the screen with your own ordnance, you might not see what's coming your way. So by making the weapons a little bit blander, it helps your survival out a little bit. There are also shield power-ups, and these are an absolute godsend because without these I would not have gotten very far. Well, that and the fact that playing on this compilation lets me use unlimited quarters. Which admittedly does kill some of the weapon upgrade magic. Because where you die is where you restart. However, the game also decides to send a little scout ship to drop a bunch of power-ups for you, and if you choose to collect them, well, you can get pretty powerful quickly, so it does kind of hurt the overall gameplay mechanics. But at the same time, seeing as it's an arcade game, and seeing as you're gonna die a lot, for a home version, it's a nice little feature. Especially if you're trying to actually record a lot of this game. The last real mechanic in terms of combat, and you don't see it too, too often, is occasionally you'll run into these enemy ships that have like these crystal balls on them. And should you shoot these crystal balls enough, they will dislodge themselves from their giant floating sea cucumber or whatever, and you can collect them. And if you do, the giant floating sea cucumber or whatever will then suddenly be your little ally thrall ship, and that's awesome! However, there is a functional problem with this, and that is, at least from my experience, when you see these little weak points you can shoot at, they tend to be in recessed areas. And because of that, it's really hard to just try and target them. Which is why every time I got to take control of one of the really big enemy ships, which is incredibly satisfying, by the way, well, they kind of die instantly because they retain as much damage as they took from when you were shooting at them. And because your lasers tend to spread a little bit wide, you get a much better chance of damaging the ship 
than its weak point crystal ball control orb thingy. That kinda sucks, especially because it's such a neat and unique mechanic. I can't say I've seen too many games that sort of play around with possession. And the fact that this one does it, but it just kind of does it in such an awkward way that you have to get really, really good at the game to, you know, successfully do it, really hurts it, especially because by virtue of the fact it's an arcade game, even if you're playing the home version, they don't give you a lot of opportunities to really exercise this mechanic, which means you don't have a lot of time to practice, which means the best way to actually get good at this is more or less to just the moment you fail or the moment you lose your ship to basically just restart the entire game and that sucks. Now there's one more mechanic in Darius Guide that I really love about this game, and as I understand, it's actually a staple to the series itself. This is actually the first one I've ever played, but when you complete an area to a game, you get a split path as to where you go next. In fact, you've got basically a full alphabet's worth of levels that you only get to go through about five per run through, but this means that the game basically becomes a choose your own adventure shmup, where you're picking your active route through the world. You're the one deciding your path. You're the one deciding your enemies, your bosses, your environments, your music. It's fantastic. And it's all simply because they decide to give you enough levels that you can just decide where you want to go. It, it puts your entire adventure within your control and power. And something about that is very special, very liberating. It feels freeing just to be able to say, yeah, this is my adventure. I'm going where I want. And the fact that there's so many different levels means that every time you play this game, or even compare it to friends who've played this game, you're gonna have completely different adventures and stories. That's awesome! Now that said, it would kind of be cool to have like a mode where you play all the levels in a straight linear fashion, but still, it's a genuinely cool mechanic. And that combined with the possession mechanics, that combined with the fact that it's an arcade game and there's gonna to be tons and tons of high score opportunities, that and the fact that each route has exclusive stuff you can see, exclusive bosses, the fact that if you're one of those hardcore arcade freaks who has to figure out how to one credit clear any game leads to an insane amount of replayability in this game. It's fantastic. And really all of that is the main reason why I like this game so much. Sure, the actual weapons and shooting are okay but not great, but it's just the sheer world and the adventure ahead of you that makes this game totally worth playing. Now the presentation to Darius Gun is really, really good and unique. Visually, they like to really play around with technical aspects of the enemy designs. For example, the first boss is this giant segmented gold koi. It appears to be designed using polygonal models, whereas later bosses are giant singular sprites, and later ones use smaller series of segmented sprites working in conjunction with each other. Think Vector Man, or ooh, Ernest Evans. They did that as well. The fact that they try to mix up the sprite styles is really, really interesting to see from a visual perspective, but at the same time, it mixes things up and keeps it always visually interesting. If a little bit jarring, I'm not gonna lie, that sort of 3D model look on the first boss, that really felt out of place. But still, the fact that everything looks different from a technical perspective is just amazing. And from an aesthetic perspective, well, I've already sort of talked about how deep sea creatures are inherently scary, so turning them into giant metallic weapon-armed versions and calling them like the big bad bosses and just standard enemies in this game is tremendous. And I can't think of too many games that make sea life your active enemy. And I mean, the environments are just beautiful and varied. One second you're flying through this completely destroyed space colony, the next you're flying through this, the clouds of this beautiful golden sky. This game is just beautiful in all regards, and the audio presentation is really unique. I think the best way I can describe it is sort of like deep space operetta. It's fast paced, it's pulse pounding, there's lots of keyboard, but there's also a lot of like um, almost opera singing in the background and that makes it really genuinely unique. And this entire soundtrack was composed by Taito's in-house band Zuntata and this is, next to Bubble Bobble, probably one of the best soundtracks I think they've ever made. I mean, the boss theme for the crazy breakdancing giant laser sea anemone was so good I bought the soundtrack in a heartbeat and I immediately had to use it in this review. Like seriously, the soundtrack in this game is very very good, it's very unique and it fits so well as well as just standing out almost as its own sort of entity within this world. It's fantastic. Now if you want to get a copy of 
Darius Guide. The only home version that was made for North American audiences was on the Sega Saturn. And while this was, along with Lair Section, probably the least expensive shmup you can get for a North American Saturn, it has gone up in price exponentially. Cheapest one I'm seeing right now is 80 bucks. Disc only, no guarantees, which is a damn shame. And the Japanese version for your Saturn, not much better. There was a Japanese PS1 version, which is more or less as expensive. However, I did find probably a slightly more affordable option if you have a Nintendo Switch, because the Switch, as I understand it, is region free, and there was a Japanese compilation cart that features pretty much every Darius game I know of on there, except for G Darius. That's about $80, but you're getting so many games for it. The one drawback is, of course, you have to have a Nintendo Switch, and I'm not sure there's really enough on it to be worth purchasing it for, but you know, this is another thing that you can get for it that would probably give you a lot of joy, just for this game alone. And hey, you get a bunch of more games with it, that's something. But you can also get this on Taito Legends 2 on the PS2, and like I said last week, it's not a super, super cheap compilation, it's about 40 to $50, and there aren't a lot of games on it I would say are really worth raving about. There's the Venerable Pushi Karat, which is the only way you can play it in North America, and that game is amazing, and that's from someone who hates that style of game. And there's this game. But you also get fun little archival bits like Camel Tree and Elevator Action Returns, that's a good one. But it's probably the least expensive route if you really want to play Darius Gaiden in North America without modding your consoles or importing. And that's simply because this game wasn't released in a lot of different ways, and when it was, the price has gone up exponentially, unfortunately. That said, Darius Gaiden, combat-wise, kind of a bland game, but still enjoyable. But everything else about this game blows the giant, horrifying space mutant fish monsters out of the water and shoots for the stars. <laughs>